Listen up or run for cover. Dropping knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. The, the, the real Robin Bradley Bombs. is dropping. What it is, Bradley, back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs. Today in the studio, I've got a local resident I didn't even know lived here, Sean Cannell. And by the way, is it Cannell or Cannell? Man, you nailed it the first time. Now I'm impressed. Well, that's how it's spelled. Yeah, well, Cannell. you got it. Most people say Cannell, but it's Cannell. Excellent. Sean Cannell. And if you haven't heard of him, then you probably don't mess with YouTube much because he's got like a quadrillion views and followers and the whole nine yards, which I believe... YouTube is the hardest one to actually get people to follow you on. I've been dropping some, what I feel, good content. I don't know if you've ever checked out my YouTube page, but you can find it at The Real Brad Lee. And I bought maybe 60, no, maybe 7,500 subscribers. And everybody always makes the same comment. I don't know why you don't have way more subs. And I'm like, I don't know, like I'm doing something wrong. So maybe I'll pick your brain on, on that because you wrote the book, YouTube secrets, didn't you? That's right. So if you guys want to figure out how to be a YouTube sensation or better yet, how about leverage your brand or utilize YouTube to drive more traffic to your brand or your service or your product, Sean Cannell's the one that's going to be able to help you out with that. Right now, have you ever heard dropping bombs? Uh, I'm, I haven't heard dropping bombs, well, but I've heard your stuff before. Well, what you're trying to basically get to happen is for me to press this button, which basically tells the bomb squad to listen up, pay attention. Cause you just said something worth listening to or made a good point. Now it's just a conversation. So you and me are just going to shoot the shiz and, um, talk about anything. And usually when that happens, you know, you get some real authentic, you know, knowledge out of the deal. And my whole thing is, it goes back from when I was a kid, but I want to get the knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. Because I think with the right knowledge, success is guaranteed. And I personally want to live in a world where success is normal. How about you? No, I agree. And Brad, you got to call the bomb squad because I'm ready to go. Well, let's do it. So, so well, you're live right now. So, so um, the bomb squad's listening. Now, the question is, if I were trying to grow my page or my subs, as they're called in the world of YouTube, how would I do it? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, you're right. We were talking earlier about YouTube being, you know, a hard nut to crack. And it sort of is in a category of its own compared to some of the other social platforms. I think just like the rules of success, you need to learn the rules of YouTube learn what matters to YouTube. For example, it's not views or subscribers that matter most on YouTube. It's minutes. Minutes matter most on YouTube. And that's why in your back uh, analytics, they want people on platform. They want them consuming content. So when you know those rules, then you would realize things like you don't want to send people away from YouTube as much. You know, if there's marketers, entrepreneurs listening, a lot of us, uh, we usually share some free content and then we take somebody to a landing page. We take somebody to a, you know, a ethical bribe, a, a, a lead magnet. But on YouTube, a lot of times you want to be creating content that keeps people on platform and maybe uh, keep them on a journey of watching three, four, five, six videos, connecting all of those videos through YouTube's features like end cards and cards so that people stay on platform. You get rewarded. That triggers the algorithm. Then you reach more people, more views. And then, of course, eventually you have to have people come off platform. So that would be it. Learning those rules, learning those nuances means that you're going to play the game different on YouTube than you do on Facebook, than you do on maybe other platforms. Now, you have courses on this, don't you? Yes. Where do they find them? Where does the bomb squad go if they want to learn? Everything's at my website, seancannell.com, and, uh, and uh, that's where they all are. S-E-A-N-C-A-N-N-E-L-L. That's right. Dot com. He'll have to apologize for using Kajabi currently, but you know we haven't had a conversation yet. Although, you're in my neighborhood. I can't believe you haven't been in. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. See, that's, a, that's what I'm talking about, a small world. My last um, guest we were talking to basically goes around and teaches. He's with the PGA. We've signed up the PGA 
Professional Golf Association. And they're out training golf professionals how to, you know, be more customer service based. And we were having a conversation. So I actually called a couple places to try and get golf lessons booked. And I'm telling you that they're terrible. They were terrible. These two anyway, terrible. So what is it? How many YouTube subscribers do you believe are just missing the boat entirely? Um, or YouTube creators? Yeah. I think, uh, I think actually the majority of entrepreneurs um, kind of approach YouTube wrong. You know, really, we, uh, we have another YouTube channel and the co-author of the book YouTube Secrets, Benji Travis. It's called Video Influencers. And we interview video influencers. And we've had people on the channel um, from the likes of, you know, the Lewis Howes or Shaleen Johnson or Gary Vee, kind of that entrepreneur tribe, learning their tips. But then if we've had proper YouTubers on the channel as well. And we're so passionate about that because, again, I think for mastering YouTube, you want to think like a YouTuber, even if you're a business owner, right? Yeah. And so, again, typically we do things maybe old school or you do things the same way you would do in direct marketing, you know, four, five, six years ago. And so you want to learn from the YouTubers and adapt that into the content, you know, that you're creating on YouTube. Um, you know, a friend of mine here in Vegas as well, right, Chris Record, uh, he had a really killer run on YouTube. And um uh, he did it really well because he was actually we're kind of being a YouTuber. He was taking notes from um, uh, some of the popular creators like the Paul brothers and different things. But then he was bringing that into his education on his YouTube channel when it came to online marketing and making money online. And he used the term that's pretty popular right now, edutainment. And thinking about not just, you know, conveying information, but also thinking about the the psychology and the energy of that end user and weaving content that is made for that platform, made for the people that are there. And that's kind of reverse engineered to succeed. Mm. So how would a business leverage it where they're not trying to be YouTubers, but they're definitely trying to drive awareness and traffic? Does it do any companies do that well? I think uh, a couple companies to look at. Kingston is a, um, a memory company. They create a lot of um, computer components and whatnot. And I, they're doing great. They've got over 100,000 subscribers, maybe coming up on 200,000. A couple things they're doing. One, they are working with personalities. They actually work with influencers. So depending on the size of your business, there may or may not be someone in your business that is the talent. Now, anybody sh could start. You could start creating. Even if you have a small business, you can grab your phone and create content. But the reason I think they're doing it so well is they've committed to consistent content. They've uh, invested in talent, right? They've invested in the right personality, whether that would be internal or external. And um, they also are having a mentality that I think is needed for success. As businesses, a lot of times we focus on, okay, well, if I create a YouTube channel, I'll talk about our products. I'll talk about what we do. I'll talk about all of our stuff. I think that's a losing strategy. I think what you want to do is you want to go bright, broader, create kind of a media company where you serve the market in general. So for instance, on Kingston's YouTube channel, they'll talk about GoPro. That's a different brand. You know, they'll, they'll talk about other cameras. They'll even touch on potentially competitors because what they want to do on their channel is add value, you know, share answers, really connect with their audience, and just put out a lot of content that is um, in that kind of broader niche serving their promise of helping you get your computer going faster and creating content better. And then throughout the content, every once in a while, they'll have their own products that are launched and whatnot. And so I think that would be the mentality that business owners should have. One other angle you could take there is that 101, you want to be uploading the frequently asked questions for your business on YouTube. If you haven't started a YouTube channel, you get questions all the time. Every business does, right? And most websites might have an FAQ section. Well, every one of those FAQs could be a video. And whether or not those ever go viral, they probably won't. They also are just a, a way of if you will, automating um, and systematizing the fact that you're answering that question all the time. So why not? You could share that other places. You could send it in an email. You could reply in a tweet to say, oh, great question. Here's the answer. And you already have a video captured from it. But also recognizing that YouTube is a search engine. It's the second largest search engine in the world. And so because of that fact, when you 
position videos in answers to questions, then you can actually get discovered for those pain points, those target audience questions, and potentially build not just your brand, your followers, but also sales um, and your customer base. Do you have a course that directly talks about how to tag the video? Yeah, uh, one of our signature courses is called Video Ranking Academy 2.0, and it's it's about understanding the kind of video SEO side, um, and really it, it it holds your hand through um, the the whole process, concept concept to completion, to think about your video ideas and even structuring your videos. But then it gets into tags, titles, topic, and and to add some value, here's a couple things that everybody that wants to win on YouTube should think about. You want to think about your title very important you know what's the the title of your video how is that worded so that it talks to um the google machine google owns youtube it talks to the the seo robots but also you want to be talking to humans right and google is a lot less literal anybody with an seo background would know that seo is changing and google is becoming kind of more human it's more intent based rather than literal keyword stuffing so you want to think about your title. You want to think about your thumbnail. You want that thumbnail to be attractive, to have people click through, complementing your title. And that's it's really important. Those are the only two first impressions, right, that if someone's going to make or break, whether they click through and watch the great content on the other side. If you don't get them with the title and the thumbnail, well, they're never going to discover that life-changing moment in the video at two minutes because they'll never click on it. Then your description, you want that to be right, and you do want those supporting keywords to be in that description and then your tags and same thing you've got keywords and uh, short keywords long tail keywords that all supports your video but those four things are not what's most important what I'd say Brad what what trumps all of those is topic you know just because you do everything right do people care are they interested and where entrepreneurs listening could really win is by tackling hot topics relevant topics, strategic topics, and it's when you touch on those in, with valuable content that you can potentially have breakout success. And if we take that a little bit level, uh, a layer deeper, some of the biggest opportunity for growing with content marketing in general is joining trending conversations potentially, you know, um, maybe interjecting your two cents into something that's happening in your industry. You know, talking about two characters in my industry that's, you know, kind of personal development and and uh, you know, online development similar here to to Lightspeed is uh, Pat Flynn and Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, Pat Flynn, Smart Passive Income, uh, great podcast, doing a lot of cool things. Um, and then Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, many people probably know him. Well, Gary Vaynerchuk made a video about how passive income is BS. You can't make passive income. Now, actually, with I just I totally disagree. I actually don't disagree, but I, I get what he was saying. But cool thing, right? So I disagree. Well, Pat was smart. So Pat Flynn made a video that said, you know, why I disagree with Gary Vaynerchuk's video about how passive income is BS. And that video blew up for him. Why? Because he joined in a conversation. He joined into something a little bit polarizing. He now, how do you find these conversations? I think you got to be listening. You remember, you remember there's a, there's a video where this guy, this older guy pops up and he just says, wow. You know what I'm talking about? I don't remember, but it He's sounds amazing. He's just goofball that just pops up and says, wow. And like, we did a little spoof here on my video and the dude popped up and I'm like, I don't get it. And, and everyone's like, oh, you'd have to be a YouTuber. And I'm thinking, well, where do all these trends, where can I go find the trends? Where can I find all these hot topics? Well, uh, what's first, a hot topic right now? A hot topic right now, I think, uh, give me a second to think on that. Where you find the trends, I think in, immediately you should think about who are the voices and influencers in your industry? What are the blogs, podcasts, YouTube channels that are relevant to your same industry? And you do want to have your finger on the pulse of those. What if you don't have an industry? I don't know what you'd do if you, you don't gotta, have an industry. You got to pick one. You got to pick one. Yeah. So, like, what industry is what I be in? It's not training. That's my company. I'm not necessarily a trainer. I mean, so I don't know you super well, and I but I've f followed your work from afar for a few years. So I know that you're in like you know you spoke at 10x a, a couple times. I know you're you're killing it on stages. I know you've built this great company, um, and I know that the people that come through here and that you've even had are some of that same kind of personal development, business development crowd, guru-y type, the guru-y kind of type 
of crowd and, and success events. And that obviously is broad and there's so many micro niches, niches inside of that. Isn't that Gary though too? Um, absolutely. And so let me give you another example. One of the characters in this industry is Brendan Burchard, right? Sure. And Brendan Burchard has his show on YouTube called The Charge Life. And one of the videos he did, just p- keeping his fingers on the pulse, was he did a video on grit, how to develop grit right around the time that, uh, I forget her name, but the author of the book Grit, Duckworth is her last name, wrote it. It was blowing up. And so it was kind of on trend. It's sort of what people were talking about. If I just pivot to answer your question, one of the things actually happening in my industry is burnout. So I released a video today. All these articles came out about YouTubers are burning out and and some of the famous ones and gamers and different things. So it's a trending topic. Blogs are talking about it. Other YouTubers are talking about it. YouTube has suggested videos. It's one of the biggest ways you things get discovered. Someone watches one thing and something else is related. So I made a video on how to avoid burnout as a YouTuber, as that I am one. So that's me paying attention to the pulse. So back to Brendan. Brendan um, makes a video about grit. Starts it out, you know, hey, a lot of people in kind of the personal development industry have been talking about grit lately. And it makes sense because this blockbuster book has been talking about it. And I think the book is good, but I'm going to give my two cents. And then he cuts into his content. So that is kind of dovetailing and pivoting on what, what are the books you know, maybe the conferences, what was the hot concept? Maybe it's maybe it's something new that it could be messenger bots. It could be something. You got to know what's hot. And, and that's the topics that maybe people are searching for, looking for. And those are your breakout moments of growth. Yeah, those are opportunities. <clears throat> Even what are they called when the, they watch the video that's, that's hot and then they talk about it? What are those called? Almost like a reaction. Yeah, a reaction video. Yeah. See, that's another way to go 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 viral it's a huge way and you know one thing we haven't really seen in the entrepreneur space and i'm kind of giving away one of my secret ambitions so here we go i guess i hope i get a bomb drop for this but i actually don't think we've seen reactions much to the entrepreneur space yeah you haven't but but that's where i was about to go with that so if you're gonna do it you know make sure you come over here so i can watch it because i was gonna do it yeah i mean there's so much there's so many gurus that a are full of shit yeah like they're not they're not real. They're, they're selling you a course and that's how they get rich. Yep. They, they don't do what they say they do. Or in other words, they're teaching you how to do something that they don't do. They sell you the course is what they do. Like show me someone who made a hundred million dollars on YouTube and then I'll buy their course. That's not them selling their course to be rich. They they discovered successful principles and now they're sharing them for money, which is totally fair. And I, I don't hate those people, but the people that, I, and I don't hate anyone actually, but the people that bother me are the gurus that are selling you courses that they've never done themselves. 100%. So I want to do reaction videos on people's opinions. Like Gary Vee, for example, he tells everybody to have patience. You should never have patience. Patience is a good way of telling someone to sit down and shut up, right? If you want something bad enough, you should take more action to get it. Make more noise, right? More activity. Have patience causes people to think, Oh, well, I have to have patience. Things take time. I should just relax. The definition of patience is that you can experience trouble, challenge, and delay without being upset. Why would anyone want to be able to do that? Like, if I'm going to delay you and you really want to go somewhere, you really want to get somewhere, why wouldn't you get upset? And I'm not talking about, like, high blood pressure upset. I'm talking about take more action, like get more animated, be more gritty if 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 that makes sense 100 percent. and and you know the pat flynn example reacting basically to gary v's passive income uh video would be similar to that so he was doing that and i think you absolutely should as should i as i you know am saying because and i think the hesitation is you know and you want to plant your flag and stand your ground but i think you start calling people out that's that's actually it's a great idea yeah and you also better be prepared to get called back out so your stuff better be solid bro because when gary v does a reaction on your reaction and all of a sudden he makes you look like a total dumbass well you better be prepared for that fallout that's right and that's that's the courage uh i think needed to to step into that arena and and that's you got to know your stuff you got you got to at least know why you believe what you believe and and have something to back it up and hey why not go for it yeah here's my other question how do i draft 
on to people's audiences. Like clearly, if if I were in your video and and there was something in your video about my channel, people watching you might discover me, right? Just like if I if I do an Instagram post about you, I'll have a bunch of people go check you out. Doesn't mean they'll follow you, doesn't mean they'll like you, but they will look at you. And then of course, if they do like you and and what you say resonates, boom, you just picked up a bunch of followers drafting off my people. So Grant Cardone, you heard him? Yep. So what he'll do is he'll have you on his show, and it's literally to get your audience. Like, yeah. Like, he 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 knows that you're going to go share it to your audience, and then your audience is exposed to him, and now he just drafted off your audience. How do people draft off audiences on YouTube? Yeah, so... How do people get in your show? Because usually these YouTuber influencers, they have their thing, and that's what they do. Yeah, so I think uh, two things you can do. I think the the grant strategy is is completely relevant and would be relevant for you, of course. Um, and but grants grant, dude. A normal Joe Blow is not going to have big people come get on their little YouTube video. You have to ha- you have to like people will go to Grant thinking. By the way, I'm going to steal Grant's audience. And by the way, it does work both ways. Yeah, but they'll go see Grant because it's Grant. I'll go I'll I'll go to Gary V because it's Gary V. You know, some dude named Charlie, he's got a YouTube channel with 16 people and they say, hey, Brad, will you come get on my video? No. Absolutely. Well, so you got to start and scale with whatever your realm of influence is. And, you know, one example is we started video influencers and it was relationship based. You know, it started from zero. We had influence elsewhere. It's an interview show. And uh, our first couple interviews led to our next couple interviews. You know what I mean? In fact, it was a friend of mine that was a million subscriber uh, her name's Nikki Philippi. She had a million subscribers. I'd met her years before we had a relationship. So when we started video influencers, I said, would you come on? She's like, of course we, we had just started. We didn't have any influence at all. And then, um, one of the second interviews I reached out for, it was our third interview total was Shalene Johnson and, uh, Shalene Johnson naturally over a million Facebook likes fitness celebrity. And she lived in Irvine, California. I did at the time as well. And so I reached out and she agreed to, to do an interview on the show. And I asked her later why she said yes. She gave me two reasons. She said, one, I trusted you because I saw Nikki Philippi. I was like, wow, that, that was the only bridge needed. She's like, if, if she's on there and she's got a million subscribers and she looks, you're probably not a psycho because she was on your show. Number two, um, I believe in the power of digital media more than even traditional. So I would probably say no to a TV interview today, but I would say yes to somebody that's sharing it on social so anyways, and then from there, it just stacked and continued to grow. But well, what the, was the key there? I think the key is st- uh, relationships. That- hey, now, there's the bomb dizzle right there. That's right, relationships. And just start. See, you didn't stop and sit there and figure out and come up with a million excuses as to why you can't do it. Most people will. Most people will. You know, I don't have that. I don't. But you did have relationships, and you did have influence. It just wasn't digital at the time. You had influence with Nikki, right? Yep. So, and more importantly, you just did it. Yep. Because if you didn't start, nothing would have happened, and you wouldn't be sitting here now, and you wouldn't be making seven figures. Well, you may be, but maybe not doing this. You wouldn't have a book out. What were you doing before this? Um, before this, uh, I was working at a church for years. That's kind of my background, church marketing. And uh, church marketing, just marketing in general, but I was like doing the email marketing Are and the video. Are you religious? Um, I would, uh, I mean, probably by some people's standards, but I don't think I I would call myself really religious. Um, my, my my faith is everything. Um, but, uh, religious people, uh, make me uncomfortable. Right. Well, I don't know the difference between religion and faith, church, organized church and faith. I'm always interested in conversations. We'll save that one for another one, especially because I've got some big questions when it comes to faith and religion. Yeah, well, we got to do this like, again. Like, who's this? Who's your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Okay, so if that's the case, right? Why do you call him Jesus when his name was not Jesus? Yeshua. That was his name. So why are you calling him Jesus now? Oh, Especially man. when the scripture says, my children will know my name. The fact that you know his name makes you, therefore, one of his children. However... There's a lot of people that don't know what you just said. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out, do I am I being called upon to like educate people? Because if you read the scripture, it says point blank, my children will know my name. So when you ask them, well, who's your Lord and Savior? They say Jesus. I say, Well, that wasn't his name. And they're like, Yes, it is. No, it isn't. 
It's clearly not his name. Never was his name. Someone gave him that name through translation, but it wasn't translation. It was transliteration or iteration, and it's not accurate, period. It's not accurate. So so if I told you, listen, I want, I want to be acknowledged as Brad Lee, man. That's all I care about. You make sure everybody knows Brad Lee put you up on the game, and, man, we're good. Anything you need, I'll be there. Just let them know Brad sent you. And then, you know, three months later, I catch – people and you're saying yeah my buddy bob told me wouldn't i be offended at all yeah i think maybe um i i 100 see your perspective but on the flip side i think uh you know i i don't want to go to the extreme of calling it possibly semantics i think that i mean if we're talking to two about god i think i know but I, now we're trying to think about what he wanted when the scripture kind of says pretty simply give praise to my name he didn't say change it he didn't say, call me whatever you want, because I'll know who you mean. He said, give praise to my name, sing glory to my name, right? Yeah, no, 100%. No, you're right. And I feel like it's kind of like a journey, though. It's unfolding. I feel like God's big enough to see us where we start, and, and we might we could be making that mistake. Now, again, do you think Jesus is God? I think Jesus is God. See, again, there's, there's a differentiator. We're going to have to have a, a, just a special episode on this, because God, you know his name? Yahweh. Right. So then it's not Yahshua, is it? I, I know that we're, you're that saying, we're deep, man. I know, but now you're saying, well, they're all one and the same. Uh, if not, that's the case, I'm not trying to say they're one and the same. I'm trying to say that uh, I believe God is big enough to. I mean, we know He's merciful. Who's we know He's God? full of grace. You're talking about Yahweh. I'm talking about Yahweh. Okay, and then who's I'm talking Yahshua. So I would be talking about uh, two different people. I'd be coming from an Orthodox Christianity perspective based on um, the Bible. Um, the Holy Bible, right? And so all kinds of different translations. We could talk about those. There's a lot of places we Have you go. ever heard or, or, or learned that the Bible, A, was man-made, right? Yeah. So was there ever any omissions or errors in the thing um, Through, I, throughout the years? I believe that the Bible is inherent, like, in, it, like unflawed. Some people disagree, right? And I believe uh, the Bible interprets the Bible. So there's a scripture that says, you know, every word is God-breathed in there. And so... Um, I don't, I don't believe there's any errors. Now, what's interesting is it was written, though, right, by Moses and David and uh, over 66 books, right, or 66 books by over 40 authors. And so um, I just believe God's big enough to have got what the information we needed in there, but we need to interpret it with wisdom because, like, just because it's in there, I mean, it says God is dead in the Bible. It says a fool says in his heart that God is dead. But if we isolated that, then you could say, well, the Bible says God is dead. So it, it needs to be interpreted. It needs to be handled rightly. And, I, and that's why I love this conversation, too, because uh, clearly I can see you're passionate about that. Well, I'm just interested because, A, by the time you know you die, you want to have some answers, don't you? And not only that, the Scripture says, tells you, seek and you shall find. Most people aren't seeking. They're listening and they're just accepting. Like, you tell me his name's Jesus, okay, good, praise Jesus. That's not his name. That's a fact. Anyone that disagrees, go back and study and seek, and ye shall find that I'm right. So at the end of the day, he tells you to do it. But anyway, this is another episode, because I want to get on the no doubt. on this one. But I definitely want to get into this episode, because, again, some people think, I'll just say Jesus, because that's who everyone calls him, which is not his name, but... Jesus and God are the same. They're not the same. And I can have a few questions that would that would kind of back me up. Like, for example, me and Jesus were the same, if I'm God, would be like me and my finger. We're all the same, right? Yeah, I mean, we. I don't know if we're talking about the Trinity right now. but Not the Trinity. But if, but I would be thinking about Trinity, Trinity, Trinity uh, so in th- theology. Yeah, but in thought, mind, actions, we're all the same. We're one. I get that. But they weren't actually one. The, the, they are they are different, and I can start to talk about it, but we'll save it for the next episode. And there, here's the reason why. When Jesus was on the cross, right, what did he say? He looked up in the sky, and what did he say? It is finished. Before that. A few other things. He Today said, you'll be with me in paradise. He said, why people. has thou forsaken, forsaken me? me? Who's he talking to? Himself? Father God. So he's talking to himself? Um, he's asking himself a question? He doesn't know the answer? When he's asking himself, doesn't he know? Aren't they the same? No, he's asking the the he's asking God, why are you doing this to me? 
right? Yeah. So that shows you that they're not the same because you wouldn't have to ask that question if you were the same. So they weren't the same. The question is, did someone interpret that we all think as one and act as one? And if you're talking to him, you might as well be talking to me. The only way to me is through him because we're all one as a analogy. And now everybody actually thinks Jesus is God. Jesus isn't God. He's the son. And he'll even say it. Look at the Bible. He said it all the all over the place. He said, I'm not the God. I'm just here on behalf of him. Yes or no? Um, I would say this, since uh, even to, to steer back to you two, but you, it's your show. You can take it wherever you want. I love that you said, you know, as the Bible <laughs> says, that he who seeks will find. And I think that's the essence. I love you said some aren't seeking. I think that's the problem. And what I, and, and this See, is my belief. And that's what I think the problem is. Yeah. I think that, uh, that you got to seek. And, and I believe, and it's my conviction that God's merciful, that he's good. And that when we seek that he's working it out, he's bigger than us. I mean, of course, David wrote in the Psalms, right? There's no way I could comprehend who you are. You're like your thoughts are not my thoughts. No. Your ways are not my ways. So, I mean, man, the world is is a tough place, right? There's obviously there's tons of confusion. It's the you devil's world, is you, it not? It, true, but you can't even get Christians to agree, right? Like, th- there's all kinds of different denominations. All that to say, I definitely trust and believe God's bigger than that all, and that when we're seeking, He's working it out, and that none of us have a full picture. One day we will, but uh, we see through a glass dimly, as Paul yep. wrote, and so uh, we're working it out, but man... I say read the scriptures, kids. Just read the scriptures and don't try to interpret them in any special way, man. It says right in them that he's not a confusing God too, right? So why is all these parables and confusing? Maybe we made it confusing. Yeah. Maybe when I say, oh, it says this, but what he means was, what he what he meant was, well, why didn't he mean what it says? How come that's a problem? Like it just says that. Why does it have to mean all this other stuff? Those are interpretations. And that's why I think there's different, you know, Christianity based, what do you call them? You yeah, know, denominations. Sections. Sex. Yeah, denominations. Yep. Anyway, we'll get back to YouTube because people need to seek for that reason. And people also need to seek for this reason. Too many people sit there and want to say, yeah, but, yeah, but they're not seeking. They're not seeking out that book. They're not seeking out and learning. And that's the problem with their business in a lot of cases. I totally agree. I I love that fact because even that Bible verse that if you seek, you will find. That's true about success too. But that another bomb, another bomb, Dizzle. But man, success like it's 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 a grind. I mean, you're gonna have those ups downs. You're gonna have you're gonna have confusion, right? You're gonna have uh, discouragement. You're gonna have things that don't work, and it's you're gonna have haters, evil doers. You're gonna have right? you're gonna have a lot of fail, failures, right? They say the master has failed more times than the amateur has even tried. Yeah. Well, again, that's a thousand percent true, right there. I'm gonna bomb you again. Now we're gonna start carpet bombing people. It's the truth, though, because people always say, "Brad, how did you succeed?" You know, look, I've failed more in my life than a lot of people have even tried. So I'm not afraid to fail because I don't see it as a failure. I just see it as, hey, I'm just not afraid to try something. You know, hey, I'm going to do a marketing campaign. Blam. Oh, that didn't work. So whatever. You know, I'm not afraid. Some people, they don't do anything because they're afraid. And more importantly, they're afraid of judgment, which which blows my mind because who cares? I mean, you should care. Don't get me wrong. Let me clarify because the bomb squad sometimes... You know, we'll take what I say and like hear something different. I think you should care about what people think. You should be courteous and kind and all that. Like you should care. However, if your opinion of me changes my opinion of me, that's what I mean. You shouldn't care. Like my opinion of me should be soul and and 100% on my own. And what you think of me shouldn't be relevant. And that's what stops so many people. They're worried about what you think of me. What if I go try this and you don't like it? What if I put this video on YouTube and nobody likes it? What if my family sees it and they laugh at me? With religion too. There's a lot of people that seek religion quietly. Mm -hmm. It's like being a, it's, it's like, you know, they don't want to come out and say anything about God because then they're, oh, you're one of them holy rollers. So they just don't do anything, which is the problem. Yep. 
Yeah. What if, you know, you're, you're 10, 20, 30 years out of high school and you're worried what people from high school are going to think about that Facebook post? And if you step out and you start something, launch something, do something. Not to mention half the time you get attention is when you're polarizing. That's right. And I've been trying to step into that more, you know, because I, I, I'm guilty of actually worrying a lot about what people think. And I've had to go through layers of, of trying to step into new dimensions of courage. In fact, in the book, we talk about the seven C's of YouTube success. The first C is courage because the first C is you got to start. You got to punch fear in the face, punch perfectionism in the face. What do you think they're so scared of? Uh, I think a lot of things. I think you're, you're, they're scared of judgment. They're scared of what that other person's going to think. Also not realizing that no one's even going to watch when you first start. Like They're not going to think anything. They're probably not going to see it. But you're worried about what people are going to think. I think you're worrying about failure. You're worrying about, you know, am I going to mess yeah, but up? What, but, what, but so what? Like That's just what you're worried what? about. Guess what? I have 7,600 and change subscribers. Is that failure? No, that's, I mean, it's insane. It's, a, that's 7,600 people. Yeah, but is that failure? I don't know what failure, what's good, what's bad. Yeah, I mean, again, they're stuck in your own head. As Tony says, Robin's right. If you get stuck in your own head, you're dead. Perception. And so, yeah, you got to get, courage is like, look, I, I, my life is not being dictated by my parents, by, uh, you know, the people I went to high school with, by any of these other things, you got to blaze your own path and you got to muster and find that courage somehow. But I think courage is also like a muscle, right? Our confidence account grows over time. Sure it does. Through competence and experience, right? So that's why you got to start because your first videos are going to be your worst videos. So people oftentimes are so afraid because they also will see, they'll see your stuff. I mean, we're sitting in this world-class studio, you know, like it's, it's just absolutely the lighting, the vibes, the audio quality. Like you watch something like this, you may, you might feel like you can't start a podcast. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, this just happened to where I decided to stick the microphones. This is actually a news desk type Facebook live. And that's like, if you want to do a TV show, but one day I, I was listening to a podcast and I'm like, I want to do a podcast. So I ordered the microphone, stuck them here. And that's the only reason we're here. We could have done this in my office. However, I just started and believe it or not, now I'm getting all these downloads. People are trying to like, see if I want to be paid to talk about products during the thing. And I'm like, no, they're like, well, come on, man. I'm like, dude, I don't, you know, I, I, if, if I ever did it, I'd have to agree with the product and the products, you know, I, I don't think I'd ever do it. Well, first you, of all, you got but, some bigger stuff going on too. So like, you yeah, know, but, for, but still all I did is I started a podcast and now it's actually getting pretty popular i mean it's definitely not the number one podcast on earth but we do have seven billion three hundred ninety eight million six hundred and twenty two thousand people that download it every episode there's like 16 people in somalia that aren't hearing about it so i always tell the bomb squad maybe share it out That's so right, we man. can reach those last 16 people then the whole world the entire world will will download my podcast. Is that crazy? Yeah, it's crazy, man. Spread so you, the word. You, you got to think it into existence. That's right. You got to declare it. Yeah. So, do you have a podcast? Uh, no podcast. I recognize the need, but uh, man, well, you kind of do because you have a YouTube show, right? And yeah. If you just simply turn that into audio and put it on iTunes in a podcast format, guess what? It's a podcast. You know how many people do that? A lot a, of people. A bunch. And I don't think those are real podcasts, like Gary V. Like he doesn't podcast, and that's why he I calls haven't it done a podcast. It. Grant Cardone, he calls it a podcast. It's not a podcast. It's a it's a video that they just stuck in a podcast format. Yeah, when I do it, and that's that's the that's the thing that has held us back is when we do it, we want to do it right, and uh, we want it to be a podcast. We want it to be like native to the platform. Just as I was saying, you got to play by the YouTube rules. I think you can have a lot of success by just repurposing content on other platforms. Some podcasters just post their podcast on YouTube as just another platform of distribution. Well, that's why I started filming these because people on my YouTube channel said, why don't you put the videos on YouTube? Well, I will. Then people that aren't really listening to podcasts will see that, realize there's a podcast and then go and vice versa. So yeah, 100%. And when we launch our podcast, we would be the same kind of vibe as this. We'll film it and we'll uh, kind of Lewis House too. I think he's doing a great job. School yeah. of Greatness goes both you know on his Lewis YouTube channel. Well? Uh, pretty well. We've he got, seems like a nice dude. Oh, he's an amazing dude. Yeah, we, we've given. Is he really as nice as he acts? He's nicer. Uh, we went. We've uh, and and man, he's such a he's such a real deal dude. He's the same. He's consistent. That's that's a cool. That's one of my favorite things about people, right? When they're the same person on stage, off stage, in the green room, backstage, and on the mountain. We went snowboarding once, and uh, with a group of people, and yeah, absolutely great guy. But uh, 
yeah, I've been really inspired by his work, but his style of filming just like this and putting out excellent content both on YouTube and a podcast, I think that's a good good example to look at. So were you making any loot working for the church? No. You, you, <laughs> you uh, I mean, unfortunately, that's that's typically uh, what happens in ministry, and, and most people are not in ministry. Parents um, rich? Uh, no. My parents, I, I'd say I grew up kind of like middle class, upper, upper middle class. Now, I mean— yeah, I mean, so you weren't killing it, not not like killing it. I mean, my my uh, my parents, my stepdad and my mom. I mean, he's a lethal entrepreneur. He he works with like Google and Facebook. I mean, they'll do like multiple multiple seven figures and um, over, but also big projects. You know, like uh, electrical, um, telecommunications, cutovers of cables and whatnot. And and so I would say this. I mean, I would I, I'd probably have to answer the question yes. I mean, if you're if you're middle class in America, I'd love to hear your two cents on this. But if if you're like, you know, doing well in America, you're rich. And if you if you had more or less every opportunity growing up, you didn't really have. I mean, I grew up in good neighborhoods and I had exposure to opportunity, so I, I feel blessed for that upbringing. Um, but from some of the people I've been exposed to lately, I mean, it's definitely caused me to think bigger, try to think smarter about lifestyle and business and scaling. <clears throat> Yeah, comparatively. And, um, comparatively. So here's my thing, which is crazy, because they say we're in a recession right now. Wow. Well, I can't tell. Can you? No. Yeah, and then someone says, well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not reaching people at your level. What are you talking about? Like, I look around everywhere I go, and I drive all over this town. There's people in restaurants. There's people driving cars. There's people at the gas stations. There's people at the movies. There's, where's the recession? I thought recession meant nobody has any money. Right? Yeah. Well, I see everybody with money. Like the whole one percent is that a is that a lie? Like the one percent make all the money, dude. Everywhere I look, people have money. Yeah. Like everywhere I go, my neighborhood, my house isn't the biggest in the neighborhood. The dude right across the street started eBay. Like he has a he has twelve million in landscaping. Okay, his house is huge. Yeah. Piero Midier. thousands of houses in my neighborhood where are those people making that money those houses aren't cheap yeah there's thousands of does the does the one percent all live next to me because this this is just vegas that doesn't include summerlin eagle hills red rock dragon ridge southern highlands like southern highlands right there a bunch of richies live yeah man those so, houses are dope up there. so again show me show me where all these poor people are now don't get me wrong i'm not naive i know there's poor neighborhoods but it seems like the poor neighborhoods are the one percent and everyone else is pretty good which which drives me to wonder like why are they spinning it you would think there's you know 90 if 99 percent of the people were comfortable and one percent were poor well then we could eliminate that just by banding together you think there's any conspiracy with that Man. maybe they don't want the one that the, the poor people helped some of these things are outside of my wheelhouse a little bit but i do know this i i personally believe in in creating your own reality and and not in some delusional way <laughs> But there oh, we go. That's, that's right. But I got a bomb for it. You got to create your own reality. You know, what are you feeding on? What are you listening to? And man, that's why like I'm cons I'm conservative with what news I consume, which is not much. In fact, yeah. my news source is a YouTuber named Phil DeFranco, you know, so good or bad. Uh, I love Phil. And uh, that's a good example. You know, a guy like Phil DeFranco, um, uh, millions of subscribers, one to two million views per episode. You know, single-handedly, he's got a small team, but like single-handedly, he's doing as much. He's, he carries as much weight as news networks. You oh know, yeah, as a YouTuber. But anyways, you know, you got to. Well, nowadays with the media, that's pro he, You know, he's probably got integrity. Exactly, and that, well, that's that's why I watch him. It's the new school, and, and uh, everybody has bias, and he acknowledges that. But one of the things he tries to do is be reasonable and actually acknowledge both sides. So, what does he say about Trump? Is Trump doing good or is Trump doing bad? He, he'll always commentate on both sides. He'll say he gives his opinion and he'll always, it, you know, it's actually funny. If we take a Bible verse, it's in Ecclesiastes. It says the man who fears God avoids all extremes. And I think there's wisdom. And man, when you get to the extreme side on either side, man, you're in trouble. Yeah, well, I don't know the extreme because I'm listening to normal mainstream media and you don't know because one side says, look, he, he, you know, North Korea, he achieved this thing. And then the other side says, no, he screwed it up. We were, we were about to do something even better than that. 
unemployment best in 40 years. Ah, well, that wasn't Donald. He's in there messing stuff up. Actually, who's telling the truth? Is he doing a good job or isn't he? I know my taxes came down. That's a fact. Yeah. I do know that. There you go. But other than that, I'm just watching the news. One news channel loves him, says he's doing everything great. The other news channel hates him. They oh, he's ruining the country. We're all in big trouble. It's extremes, man. It's the it's the polar opposite but, sides. But what does DeFranco say? He says he says both. He'll acknowledge. I mean, you can't you can't deny that uh, President Trump has has made a major impact. A friend of mine asked on Facebook the other day, obviously this is super isolated. He got a ton of responses, but it's just one person in one community. But he said, hey, I know there's all this drama and people hate the president or they love the president, whatever. I just have one question for you. Are you doing better now since he's been in office or worse economically? Just, the answer is better for everybody. It, it, it was, I found one comment, hundreds of people replied, and it was all better. And so obviously that's not everything. And, and uh, when you go on the other side, there's other issues. But man, and that's, again, create your own reality. Like I'm not the most political person. In fact, you know, when, I've, when I, I'm so focused on my family and on our business and on, you know, our world and, and, and our community and even things we do with our church and whatnot, I just think, I sometimes wonder, I can't know about all this other stuff. I got I to gotta stay in my lane. I got to protect my confidence. I gotta not only f- that, what you focus on grows. 100 percent if you're focusing on the negative you're going to get more negative and i want my family to grow i want my faith to grow i want my team to grow i want my our bottom line to grow i want our influence to grow i want the world to be a better place because we're here and the impact that we're making and so those those are the things i invest my energy in and so unfortunately though and and i recognize that you should do your your civil duty and your due diligence of being involved but but uh but at some level i'm like man i i just i'm just gonna stay in my lane so a business is out there trying to get ahead in life based on what you just said what they ought to do is put their ear and their you know finger on the pulse of whatever industry they're in tap into the trends and the and the latest stories turn on their iPhone give their opinion about something upload it tag it right get go get your video ranking academy course tag it right and that could theoretically spark into one of those conversations and go viral absolutely and uh you know there were actually we were on a coaching call with our inner circle community um last night uh and we were talking to one of the youtube channels is actually a channel that's a parody trump channel and i actually couldn't when i was reviewing it because that kind of gave me insights like that coaching that's hands-on from myself and my team and uh and, and I actually couldn't tell which side he was on. I didn't know if, if he was pro-Trump or not. But the point is, it was a comedy channel. And so he had a couple breakout videos. Why? Because CNN is suing Trump. So he makes a video about it. You get that video out quickly, and it's helping him grow his influence because he's writing trends. He's writing culture, right? He's commentating. And by the way, when I say breakout, I'm saying he's a newer YouTuber, just a few months in, uh, or content creator. And he's getting 300 views, 550 views, 850 views. Now, is that a lot? But let's put this in perspective. If you start from scratch in a world with seven plus billion people and nobody knows you and there's all this competition, if you're getting 850 views from just using your smartphone and being able to just use some of your free time to grow your influence, that is insane. Is that a lot? That is unreal. Like tell my grandpa about that fact that it's happening while he was trying to grow his dental practice that you could use free platforms like YouTube or the other social networks and the barrier to entry was the quality of your content and the amount of hustle that you put into getting it out there. But if I have a brick and mortar, some dude watching my stuff in India would be irrelevant. Could be, and and that also could be, though, to the scope of your vision. Because if you have a brick and mortar, why aren't you thinking about maybe uh, creating a digital course that could be available globally? If you've built a successful uh, brick and mortar, why aren't you maybe considering um, kind of creating a mini media company where you could help people learn Learn, how you did what you did? So there's just different, it would have to be connected to your ambition. Could you use YouTube to get isolated people into your uh, burgers and shake restaurant because of like ranking videos? Probably not. But what you should be doing there is using YouTube ads, Facebook ads, not, local not, targeting. Not only that, based on what you talked about, you could figure out a way to do it. You certainly could. And you could do local search. But I mean, the, the fact of somebody 
uh, going to YouTube and being like, you know, which burger place in Vegas probably wouldn't happen. I think what I would do if I'm that, sh- that shop is what happened to me the other day. Last snowboard season, I land in Park City. And in my Instagram feed started showing up all this stuff to do in Park City. Paid ads targeting me directly. They knew I was there once I checked in. And I thought, you know, this is the way to get in front of people. So, you know, as we talk about this too, there's, it's, it's got to be holistic. We've talked about one strategy as far as writing trends. I think you do want that more comprehensive vision for how are you going to take your company, your content, and, you know, optimize it and strategically uh, use it to grow what you're doing. And it's a little bit nuanced depending on what your industry is or what your business is. Yeah, but if you can get, if you can tap into it, man, it can make a big difference. 100%. And one of the things we are recognizing right now that's causing us to have a lot of urgency, and, and I'd love your take on this because you've uh, you know got a much more influential legacy than what we've built so far. We're still pretty early in this game, is that we're seeing this as a window of opportunity on this. Again, I am a small town kid, college dropout, with no formal film school education, no uh, nobody, no college education. Period, um, and uh, and I started filming videos in my bedroom. And fast forward a couple years, I'm running a million dollar company. Um, what the heck, you know? Just because on, on the backs, and you know, some people complain about social networks. They say the algorithm changed. I I, I never understood how people can understand about social networks. I need to go to Susan Wojcinski, the CEO of YouTube. I've never met her. I, w- I would give her a hug. I need to send her flowers. And and she's not even the founder. I need to send the, fa- the founders of YouTube flowers. And they probably wouldn't want it. I think it was founded by all dudes. Why? Because they gave me this free platform that with a smartphone, I can use it at my leisure. And all the features and all the development and all the distribution, the global distribution, over 2 billion monthly logged in users with a Gmail account on YouTube right now, 2 billion. Facebook's only like 2.2 and I think it's receding ever since this Cambridge Analytica thing and whatever else is happening there. But Instagram's doing great, so Facebook is fine regardless, right? And so, but but YouTube is this amazing place. And again, if you can just get the courage to step out and start putting in the work and start shooting some videos and learning the tips and learning the rules, that you at least have a shot. I mean, I'm not trying to guarantee anybody anything. Well, you said after several years. What was your first video? Well, my first video was, uh, number one, terrible. And I just sat down and I said, all right, I think I'm going to start a a vlog. And don't expect me to be energetic. What was it about, though? Nothing. (laughs) It was me saying, so I think, um, uh, hey, YouTube, uh, here's here's the first first ever video. And I I literally said, I'm not going to be energetic or entertaining. I'm just going to sit here and, and obviously a lot changed since then, but it's so funny. I play it when I speak at different events and uh, people always laugh because it, it's, it's, it's terrible. Like, but I started and it's one of my favorite videos. Cause if I never would have put, you learn so much just by doing stuff. There you go. You got to just step out, do some stuff. Too, so many, I, too many people fear failure for some reason. And judgment. It, I think it's judgment because, because nobody's afraid to fail or they wouldn't even get out of bed. I think they're afraid to be judged. I think that's the bottom core problem is they are afraid of what you and you and you and you and you might think. Yeah, 100%. Which tells me that there's a confidence issue. And when you were talking about competence leads to comp- confidence and that loop, right, that that just stacks over time. You know, for me, uh, my second video was terrible too. My 50th video sucked pretty bad as well. So... By now, I've uploaded over 2,000 videos online. You know, maybe we're approaching 3,000, whether that was for clients. I had a whole season where I was doing a lot of client work, and I worked with a lot of speakers and authors. Did you edit them yourself? I've, yeah. Oh, and and all, all of, all like 3,000 videos. Probably the last few hundred now um, have been, it's scaled as we've grown as a team. But yeah, coming up, it was all me. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah, those thumbnails, you know. I think they're fairly important. I had a guy do mine for a minute and it looked like I was, um, you know, a Marvel comic page. I'm like, dude, you can't have like, you know, less loud Miami vice ish looking thumbnails. What's the thumbnail rule, man? I think, I think though you just said it right. I think Marvel comics could be good, but you got to stay on brand. Yeah. You got to know your brand. So, so he might've made a mistake, not understanding, uh, your vibe or he didn't capture that. I don't even think I know my vibe, my vibe. 
I, I tend to like to think it's cool, but but you know what's a cool thumbnail look like? Well, I I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I actually I, I I can I'm picturing it right now. I can picture what a cool thumbnail looks like. But I could see that just because Ninja, the Fortnite gamer, right, uh, and all of the gaming that's blowing up. Well, you could look at the gaming industry and be like, well, their thumbnails are this way, so I should do that as an entrepreneur. And I think we make that mistake it's no learn the principles but then bring them into what it is you're creating you know you're born an original don't die a copy hey there come on now kids there's another good it's so you want to uh you want to learn from those youtube best practices but then you want to adapt them to be unique and here's one of my favorite thoughts generally this is true for social media across the board uh sally hogshead wrote a book called uh, fascinate she has a quote of how do you stand out in today's marketplace as it's getting more crowded and there's all these gurus like how do you stand out and she said different is better than better yeah you got to be different you know you don't you're not trying to like oh man this is how gary's doing his thumbnails this is how grant's doing his thumbnails i should do them the same way no like you might want to learn those principles but but, but you also got to realize success does leave clues it does leave clues so sometimes you do want to do exactly what they're doing that's true that's true but you don't want to just be that echo and i think you could you could do i feel like principally you could do exactly what they're doing but when you do it yourself i mean again maybe the colors are different obviously maybe the way you dress your vibe your style is going to be different and your vibe attracts your tribe yeah and so people are going to resonate with the fact that maybe you are kind of more hipster and cool and your thumbnails are minimalist. Or maybe other people are going to resonate with it's a little old school. It looks like an old optimized press page with like, you know, marketing from 10 years ago, whatever. Like, I think you really do need to have that self-awareness and develop your brand over time. So you bring something a little bit unique to the space. Well, dude, now that you live next to us, you, you, you can come by and figure out a deal where I'll get you a VT system and, and waive some fees and you just make my YouTube channel explode. You can't have, you know, a lot of your audience follow me or the podcast because, you know, not on this particular episode, but there's a lot of, uh, let's just say colorful words in, in a lot of my content, which I don't know why, you know, when I went out on 10 X two, I must've dropped 20 F bombs. And then I went to another uh, event where I didn't say any. Someone said, well, why did you quit cussing? I'm like, I think it's the environment that you're in. Like, I, I, I'm i not afraid to cuss right here, but I think it's just because, you know, the group that I'm talking to, our, our conversations, you know, a little more, I don't, I don't want to say intelligent, but it's like, it's just a different conversation. You know what I mean? Yeah. If someone came in here and I wanted to, you know, talk about bars and, you know, stuff. I think that's where the, the language changes, but don't, don't recommend people go listen. If you're, if, if you're worried about cussing, Hey man, cause I will, I will drop an F bomb. Like it's going out of style. You know, I think at the end of the day, uh, we serve adults. I mean, you know, like we're, we're not creating kids content. And so uh, we believe that, that people can, we, we can handle it. They can handle it. Yeah. And especially nowadays, man, kids nowadays, you know, they're, 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 they're listening to cuss words with or without you. You know, my, yeah. my little girl, I have a two, I have a three and a five year old. And my little girl was saying some word the other day. I'm like, where's she learning that? My wife says you. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't do that around them. I saw her on a YouTube. We have the YouTube parent parental controls. All they have is YouTube kids. And there's some, some language on that. Then we go to the store she wants to buy unicorn poop. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She hands me the box. I'm, I'm like about to tell her, quit saying that. The box with the toy on it says unicorn poop. Then the other one comes up with the emoji of a pile of shit. Yeah. And asks for it. And I'm like, what's this world coming to, folks? <laughs> what's happening? They, they One of them's licking on poop, and the other one's wanting to buy poop, and the whole day they were talking about poop. Yeah, and some, some marketer behind there is uh, raking it in. Somebody is. Yeah. Somebody is. All right, so listen, Bomb Squad, if you guys want to follow Sean, go to seancannell.com. Um, if I were you, I would definitely buy the book YouTube Secrets because here's the thing. I don't want to be Josh Paler Lynn. I don't want to be Sean Cannell. But I do want attention. Every business needs attention. And if you can figure out how to get in the game and start, like Sean just talked about, how to 
how to, you know, leverage what everyone else already learned ahead of you, right? These hashtags and these, I mean, it's not rocket science. It's the same for everybody. You got the same tool. You can um, create a, a bigger business, drive more traffic and, and reach a whole lot more people. So I'd, I'd recommend going to get that from you. What, what else uh, do you, is Sean Cannell where all your products are? Yeah. I mean, uh, seancannell.com will lead you everywhere. Um, and, and all the digital products and training and coaching is on there as well. But if you just go straight to YouTube, two places, you can type in the word think space media, think media. That's, uh, my, our main channel, myself and my team produce content on that channel, helping people with the best tips and tools for building your influence online. So the tools, Hey, what kind of camera, what kind of gear, what kind of, uh, you know, tools do you need? Uh, lighting, all that stuff. And then the tips, some strategies, and then Video Influencers is a separate channel on YouTube. Great channel um, about a weekly interview show, how to build your influence with video. And we've had like Grant Cardone on there. I think we got to get you on there just talking about because. Well, I got to get some influence first. I, I got less influence than a pickle. I don't know about that. Dude, I did 7,600 subs. I, that's funny how they call them how subs. Many, how many videos has Lightspeed helped produce? Oh, a bunch. Ridiculous amounts. Like zillions. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're a, you're a video influencer, and hey, seven thousand five hundred subscribers. Like we like we literally serve millions of videos. We don't call them videos because they're not. Um, but we serve millions of videos per per month for sure. Exactly. So so you're you're at a whole nother stratosphere. And one of the things we love in our community is is the fact that a lot of these social media influencers, though, man, they're broke. Man, they're broke as a joke. We'll go to these places, and they're like living paycheck to paycheck. They might even be doing big, big deals, but they don't have a business. And so that's why we love to bring people to our community. Man, you're on this journey to a billion dollars, right? That's correct. And so like, you're doing some real stuff, and that's why we really believe that our community needs the tips. They need the strategies and stuff, but they also need to learn how to be real entrepreneurs, build some real stuff. Well, my book's coming out. It's called The Hard Way, and it's basically stuff I learned the hard way so you don't have to some good life lessons along the way. I'm an old dog. I've been learning tricks for a long time, but yeah, I'll be on your show and I want you back to let's, 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 let's see if we uh, can save a few souls. Cause if you ask me, man, it's all about knowledge when it comes down to the end times. Now, again, who knows, but I want to talk more about that um, with you. Can't wait. All right. Well, thanks for showing up here to, today, folks. Listen, go out, rate the podcast, follow Sean, and make sure you tune in next time. Till next time.